You're listening to the German Grand Prix podcast on Formula One Fancast. You can follow us on Twitter at Formula One Fancast. To keep up to date with latest Formula One news, visit www.formulaonefancast.com. Well, last year's German Grand Prix may be remembered for all the wrong reasons. However, on Sunday, we were all treated to a fantastic race at the Nürburgring in which Lewis Hamilton came out on top. Ferrari's Fernando Alonso came home in second ahead of Red Bull's Mark Webber. And Will Vincent is here with me as always to review the German Grand Prix. How are you, Will? Good and tag. Right, well, uh, before we do look back at uh, enthralling weekend at the Nürburgring, uh, myself and Will, I'm sure I'd like to send our condolences to those who've lost loved ones in the horrific Norway attacks last week. Coming on to the German Grand Prix weekend now, and Will, what a fantastic weekend for Lewis Hamilton. Oh yeah, it was a great race from start to finish, great weekend for Hamilton, you know, put in an amazing qualifying lap to get himself onto the front row, and then a great race all the way from start through to the end, great strategy, you know, great in the box, great on track, amazing race for him. And, you know, bearing in mind he wrote up McLaren's chance of challenging Red Bull in the weekend, they did a phenomenal job on Saturday to split the Red Bulls in qualifying. I think that's what you need to do, you need to say, oh, we're not going to be the best this weekend, and then you all of a sudden are one of the best. It seems to me whenever Red Bull say, oh, this isn't our good racetrack, all of a sudden, you know, they're five, six tenths faster than everyone else, and when McLaren say, oh, we're not going to be very good this weekend, look at them. But let's be honest, that, without doubt, was Hamilton's best qualifying performance of the year. That was possibly one of his best qualifying laps, full stop, ever. I mean, that was a great lap. I mean, he really managed to nail it there in Q3 there. Um, and it was really kind of unexpected, but after looking at Q2, you could see that he was going to kind of be up there. It was just a case of whether or not he would be able to get onto the front row or not. And he, like you said, he got off to a great start in the race, and he put in a faultless performance. Well, yeah, I mean, he did an amazing job all the way from the very start of the race, you know, going to turn one, very good, all the way, you know, the race, he managed to, I think he called it controlled aggression or something, so, I mean, yes, he's still driving the way he always used to drive, but I think he's learnt that you need to manage the tyres a little bit more here and there, you need to be a bit more cautious every so often, not go for every single overtaking manoeuvre that comes and all that, but it was a great race, one of his best races so far. But you could argue that a turning point in the race came on lap 33 when Hamilton pulled off a tremendous move on Fernando Alonso, but taking the outside line at turn two to get past the Spaniard. Oh, Will, that was a truly sensational uh, move by Lewis, and that has to be a contender for overtaking manoeuvre of the season. Oh, yeah. I mean, Alonso was on his back foot, per se. I don't think he expected Hamilton to try and overtake him there when he did. I thought, okay, through turn one now, I've got the lead, blah de blah, and then bump, there's Hamilton on the outside. It was an amazing amazing move uh, it shows as well that Hamilton still has that determination that drive to take positions when he thinks he can do so I mean we've seen throughout the race you know that turn two was very treacherous especially if you put you know just one wheel on the astro turf on the outside so to have the guts to go on the outside and do that pass was amazing and he made it stick as well well you'd say now that Lewis Hamilton's back in the game and he needed that after what happened at Silverstone and Monaco well yeah um, I mean it always takes one bad race to put you on the back foot for the rest of the season but it also takes one good race to really revitalise you and put you back in the hunt I mean we see for example with Button on his championship year he had a string of so many kind of like mediocre races that he really was always looking for just that one really good race to get back in the hunt you go back to 99 for example with Eddie Irvine had he have had you know a good race in that period when Schumacher was away then maybe he would have been in a better contention to beat Hacken for the championship it's always momentum not from lap to lap but from race to race as well and it's making the best of the races where you're not so good so on the races where you are good you feel more comfortable and ready to take those opportunities but on the other side of the coin, Jensen Button had yet another weekend he'll want to forget after only being able to qualify 7th and a full second behind his teammate. Qualifying didn't go to plan for the 2009 World Champion. And on Sunday, Button made a poor start and was then later forced to retire due to hydraulics problems. Uh, another weekend, Will, uh, Jensen will not want to remember. I think that Button's taken some of Webber's bad luck in the last few races. All of a sudden, Rebbe seems to be, you know, be on the pace and do everything well, and all of a sudden, it's Button that seems to have some mechanical issues and everything. But again, his qualifying performance wasn't what you'd expect from a Formula World Champion, especially as Lewis was right up there on the front. And again, we say time and time again, Button really does need to work on his qualifying performances if he's ever going to have the chance of being a World Championship contender. And race as well. I mean, he didn't get off to a, clean, a very good start either. 
and this is where Button normally is very good those first few laps methodically getting his way through other drivers but I don't know I think yeah definitely it was a week to forget for him and he'll just be looking forward to the Hungary ring being a full second behind his teammate in qualifying that'll be a concern for Jensen well yeah definitely I mean you always compare yourself first to your teammate then the other 23 drivers in the field after that 22 drivers even but for him to be that far behind Lewis it's a bit staggering to be honest I mean yes that was a superb lap from Lewis he probably pulled at two three tenths out of the bag that you couldn't find elsewhere but that's still seven tenths of a second and that just can't be down to Button not being able to nail a single qualifying lap alone. It's got to be something else that he's doing that he needs to look at. Well, Hungary next, and Jensen will be hoping for a strong weekend and a track that he normally goes well around. Well, yeah, he got his first one pre win there, obviously. And yeah, the Hungaro ring really suits Lewis. Um, sorry, Lewis. Um, it will suit Button really well, um, especially as it will probably have very high tyre wear. Hungaro ring's been notorious for tyre wear issues. Um, and managing your tyres are going to be key, especially um, depending on what tyre choice Pirelli brings to the Grand Prix. And Button will do well there if he manages to sort his qualifying out. Um, if he starts in the top four, then he'll be fine. If he's any lower in the fifth or lower, then you know it, he might as well just park the car again and get ready for Belgium. Well, after his stunning win at Silverstone, Ferrari's Fernando Alonso finished the race second. The Spaniard started the race from fourth, but come the end of race day, he found himself standing on the second step of the podium, and the points keep on coming for Fernando. He always talk about how Ferrari's been on the back foot for the past two seasons at the start, and then they put so much effort into developing the car, and then come the middle of the season, late in the season, Ferrari seemed to be the team to beat and it's just a bit weird when it comes to Ferrari it's like they've got all those expertise at Marileno they've got all these people working for them and I don't understand why they couldn't have been this on the pace at the start of the season but Fernando did a terrific drive there he really used the strategy to his advantage I mean yes he did lose the lead to Lewis essentially by napping in turn one but I think even if he had kept the lead after his pit stop, I think Lewis still would have beaten him to the flag. Well, obviously, uh, Fernando would have liked to have won the race, but nonetheless, it was still a strong weekend for Alonso and Ferrari. Well, yeah, especially when you consider the fact that he was ahead of the two Red Bulls. It's still essentially a win for Alonso, the fact that, you know, Vettel was, you know, off the podium for the first time ever this season. And... I think that Ferrari will take a lot of positives from um, this weekend. I mean, again, they've always said it's not one of their best tracks. McLaren are very strong, but as Alonso was saying this past week, McLaren and Ferrari always need to work together to get as many people between the front of the field and the Red Bulls as possible. Because if there's only going to be one of them coming first and it's still going to be Red Bull second and third, then Vettel's still going to win the championship. They need both the Ferraris, both the McLaren to be doing ultra well pushing the Red Bulls down to 5th and 6th if they've got any chance of trying to fight for the championship. And we saw Alonso in his uh, post-race interview with uh, Lee McKenzie. Uh, still has a bit of a soft spot for McLaren. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> I think pe- the media still blow it out of context a little bit. I yeah. think that the issue was when he raced for McLaren with Hamilton. I think, you know, times have moved on. He's, he's happy at Ferrari now. And he's got everything he wants at Ferrari. I think the team dynamic at that moment in time probably wasn't the best for him. Especially as you had, you know, Lewis Hamilton trying to establish himself alongside Alonso, a double world champion. Um, I think that's what peeved him off the most. But I think now he would very happily walk into the McLaren garage and say hello to the guys there. And I'm sure that if Hamilton was going to come and say hello to him in the Ferrari garage, he'll be very happy to have a conversation with him. But yeah, he, he does seem to still like these McLaren boys for some reason. I don't know why. Well, uh, Fernando's teammate, current teammate, Felipe Massa, came home fifth after losing out to the Red Bull Sebastian Vettel on the final lap in the final pit stop. Massa was in front of Vettel heading into the pit lane on the final lap, but Sebastian left the pit lane ahead of Felipe after the Ferrari pit crew was slow to release the Brazilian. Uh, no doubt the uh, Ferrari pit crew robbed Massa of a fourth place finish. Yeah, I think the Ferrari boys have been faultless all weekend till then. It was just, when it mattered, they weren't right. And I think also that Ferrari tried matching Red Bulls too much there. I think that if they had the guts to go on the alternate strategy, they would have you know, not had as much pressure on them. They could have released the car, done anything they needed to have done. But the fact that they waited till the last lap, you know, had to pit pretty much at the same time as Vettel, 
and the fact that Better would come out the pits first, it was never really going to work for Ferrari. They need to have one of their fastest stops of the season if they were going to make it work. I think Massa did a very good drive this weekend. Still nowhere near Alonso, which is a bit of a concern for him. But the fact that he did, until the last lap, keep Vettel behind him would be very encouraging for young Brazilian. So, so I take it you would have brought in Massa earlier then? Yeah. I mean, Red Bull, you could hear the Red Bull team radio was saying, if, you, if Massa comes in this lap, you know, you stay out, this, that and the other. And I think Massa should have come in the lap beforehand because... Yes, the soft, the the um, alternate tyres were what one and a half, two seconds slower per se, but then he would have had a full racing lap on those tyres and would have been able to blitz his third sector, his first sector, and be able to try, you know, beat Hamilton, um, beat Hamilton, beat Vettel out of pit lane. Coming on to Vettel and Red Bull now, uh, last year's world champion fell, failed to make it onto the front row of the grid for the first time this season and during the race we saw him making some rare mistakes well not the best of weekends for Vettel but he still finds himself 70 points clear of uh, his nearest rival in drivers I think Vettel was lucky this race lucky that he didn't do worse than he did I mean he could have finished fifth that would have been a few more points which if Ferrari and McLaren stay as strong as they are those few points could be vital come the end of the year and also he was lucky in the fact that it seems to be like only one of the McLarens is good and only one of the Ferraris is really good ahead of him. Yeah, the first time he's not been in the front row all season, I mean, the fact that he's having to look at the lights from someone else in front of him would have been a bit weird for him. Still, I did expect slightly more from him in the, in the race. I don't know what happened to him with his strategy and everything. He just didn't seem to have that raw pace when he needed it. He had it at times, but then it just seemed to go away. And he was completely outperformed by Weber this weekend. Well, despite Seb finishing fourth on Sunday, the likes of Lewis, Alonso, Weber and Button would no doubt like to be in uh, Vettel's shoes. And for sure, Vettel is still in the box seat. Well, yeah, but the issue always becomes, if you're that far ahead in the championship and people start nibbling into your lead, there's nothing you can do about it. We saw that again with Button in when his championship year. And once those guys start nibbling into your lead, taking you know, five points here, seven points here, ten points here... It's very demotivating, and then it's almost like you're trying to race to try and get back into it. So you're almost trying to do twice the work, and that obviously leads to more mistakes. I mean, obviously, we saw the issue last year with Red Bull and their engines. I mean, they were very close in engines last year. We've seen there's been a lot of issues, for example, with Kurs, DRS, etc., this year. Um, also, brake issues, surprisingly. But I think. Vettel needs a few good more races and he'll have pretty much have the championship sewn up. What he doesn't want is Ferrari and McLaren between them to win the next few races because otherwise that will completely ruin all his hard work from the start of the season and put a lot more pressure on Red Bull, which I think is the most susceptible team to crack out of the lot. And Red Bull cannot afford to get complacent. Definitely not. Their trump card is and always will be Adrian Newey. I mean, this guy has done so much good work. I mean, he's also been around in very different situations so he knows how to produce a car that works well for a year he knows how to produce a car that works well and he add bits to it over the year the, the rest of the team you know the pit guys still need to make sure every pit stop is flawless the guys on track still need to make sure that they're turning in fast laps all the time and, team, and the guys in the back as well they can't get complacent because you know if you have one retirement there's 25 points gone out of your lead bump that's a third of it gone well, as for Mark Webber, he put in a fantastic lap on Saturday to qualify pole, but on Sunday, the Australian was unable to capitalise and finish the race third. Uh, Will, another missed opportunity for Webber to get his first race win of the season. Well, yeah, I think the guys on BBC TV said he didn't lead a lap at all this season coming into the race. And still, he, I think he's only led less than 10 laps all season, which, when you consider the fact he's had three pole positions, is atrocious. Simple as that. I think his race start still needs to get a bit better. I think that he still needs to be more committed when he goes on to coming out of pit lane. His in-laps and his out-laps need to get a lot better. And I think also that he... I don't know. I think he was just at a disadvantage of the strategy game here. Uh, because they always still seem to put Vettel's interest first. But when it came to Weber, it seemed always to be a lap too soon or a lap too late. And it, it always seemed like they were planning their strategy almost around Vettel and they were saying to her, OK, you can come in here, you can come in here, but you can't come in here. 
but uh, Mark did finish the race ahead of Sebastian so that will be a huge boost for him well yeah especially after Silverstone um, the first thing you always want to do is beat your teammate and he did that so that's a good start not bad for a number two driver he'll say again I think Weber wanted more from the race but knowing the fact that he beat his teammate he'll be content with third especially the fact that you know Vettel's not on the podium well Weber did win at the Hungar Ring last year can he do it this year? no why? because I think Alonso will win not uh, McLaren's? I think McLaren's will be strong but I think Alonso will win the race Alonso's got that more of a drive and determination than McLaren I mean we look back about 3-4 races I think Ferrari were pretty much writing off the chances for this season and then Luca de Monticello said no um, we, we're Ferrari we're here to win and if we're not here to win we're not going to race and I think that in the Ferrari camp they still believe they can win this championship in the McLaren camp they're thinking we can win races but they don't think we can piece that together to win a world championship still and that's the difference and I think that's what will drive Alonso to race victories and that's the reason why McLaren will be picking up the pieces for the rest of the season well, along with Lewis Hamilton Force India's Adrian Suter will have been a contender for driver of the day after the German finished the race in a superb 6th place Suter was able to make his 2 stop strategy work and he even beat both Mercedes drivers uh, Will, a fantastic result for Adrian and Force India It seems to be for some strange reason that one of the Force Indias does really well every race and the other one seems to have a mishap Force India to start with they've got two amazing drivers they've got Suter which is who is a very good, solid driver, which is what you need in a team, especially in the mid-pack. You want someone who can pick up race point after race point after race point and won't go crashing the car into someone else every race. But then you've also got Paul DeResta, who's a very good up-and-coming star. And they're almost like training him and developing him up, and he's doing an amazing job at the same time. I think Sutil here, one, probably more because of his experience, managing to make that two-stop strategy work. I mean, this did prove like one of the tracks that if you wanted to manage your tyres, you could do so and manage to make a two-stop of work. I think it was really good from CTL, to be honest. Flawless performance. Well, that performance, at, well, that resort, I should say, at uh, Germany saw Force India leapfrog Toro Rosso in the constructors, and that battle for six in the constructors between Sauber, Force India, and Toro Rosso is going to be interesting, isn't it? Well, yeah, definitely. And let's not forget where Force India come from. Um, you know, obviously they, they're almost back where they were in the glory days of Jordan. Um, yes, they're not contending for race wins like they were in ninety eight, ninety nine, but they're still doing a very good job, um, and they've managed to rebuild that team after so many years of ups and downs. What they were in Midland at the first point, then they changed it somewhere now. Spiker, yeah, yeah Spiker, Midland. It was it was horrible seeing that team as they were for a few years. And I think ever since um, Fisichella's second place at Belgium, that team's just been on the up. I mean, they've got the confidence, they've got the motivation, and they, they're the best of the privateers by far at the minute. Um, let's not forget, you know, Mercedes is a proper works team. Toro Rosso, pretty much a Red Bull B team, per se. So they've still got all the expertise coming down from them. And a lot of people don't really classify Red Bull as a privateer or anything anymore because of the fact, you know, they've got such a good tie with Renault that, you know, they're probably getting better engines than Renault themselves. Um, but great job from um, Force India. It's also great to see Sauber back in the hunt as well. I mean, Sauber's got two awesome drivers. Kobe Ashley, one of the best overtakers there is today and one of the most exciting drivers there is today. And... I mean, Sauber's really, really solid, and they managed to keep that going with their limited budget all the way through the season, which is really good for them as well. We're coming on to Force India again. Now, Paul De Resta once again had another frustrating race as he finished 13th. He got touched by Nick Heidfeld on the first lap, but uh, did well to recover finish 13th. He did, yeah. And 13th place is still, you know, a whole race under his belt. It's still, you know, more time testing the car, more time developing the car, essentially on track. And he'll learn a lot from that as well this weekend. Um, maybe he'll be a bit more cautious in his start next week, not next week, at the next race. Overall, he's had a solid weekend. Um, I think when he came in at the start of the season, he didn't expect to be scoring points as often as he did. So when he does have incidents like these, it does put him on the back foot, but he also remembers where he's come from and the team is in so he won't be too disheartened about that well there's been speculation about Nico Hulkenberg wanting a Force India race seat for next season so it's going to be interesting to see who the driver lineup is for them next year they'll be stupid to get rid of 
the rest are. But at the same time, they'll be stupid to get rid of Sutil because the two together work really well. You don't want to have a team with two young drivers like Hulkenberg and Duresta, but I think if you were to have one of them, Duresta on paper is the better driver. So I'll take you to go for Sutil and Duresta next season then? Yeah. Okay. Well, Nico Rosberg and Michael Schumacher finished Sunday's race, 7th and 8th for Mercedes. A uh, double points finish for the team, but this was supposed to be the season where we saw both drivers challenging Red Bull, Ferrari and McLaren on a regular basis, but it uh, hasn't panned out like that. I think Mercedes would get how difficult it is to develop a fast car nowadays. I mean, they haven't got the kind of technical lineup as Red Bull, McLaren or Ferrari have, and that alone puts them on the back foot. And also, I think there's too much expectation put on the team. They're forgetting that, you know, they're doing better than we were doing last year. That's an absolute given. And officially, this is only his second year in Mercedes as well. It's been a good result for the guys. To get a double points finish is always good, especially in front of the German crowd. So that will please a lot of the guys down at Mercedes. I think that they're not far off being the best of the midfield teams, but they still got some work to do to be there. We see glimpses of Schumacher's brilliance every so often. We saw it at Canada, we saw it a little bit at Silvers, and we saw it again here. The old guy's not giving up yet, and I think that would be stupid to completely write him off. And a pretty eventful home race for Schumacher. Well, yeah, definitely. People forget that Schumacher was involved in so many incidents in his World Championship winning years. I mean, you look at 94, 95, and then you look up to see stuff like, for example, Villeneuve, Herrera, if you look at the incidents he had in 98, 99, when he was trying to win the championship, even when he was, like, you know, dominating the field, he was still involved in tussles. So, to say, oh, Schumacher's lost the plot is completely outrageous. I think what it is more is that because he's not leading the races, people's picking on little bits that they get out of him a lot more. Well, I'm one of those who still feel we've yet to see the best of Nico Rosberg. Uh, this is Rosberg's sixth season in Formula 1, and some will argue that he should have won a race by now, but to be fair to him, uh, he hasn't been given a car in which he can challenge for race victories. Rosberg is Germany's version of Jensen Button, simple as that. I mean, obviously, look at Jensen, how he started at Williams, which wasn't a very good team in 2000. Then he went to Benetton, which wasn't a very good team when he was at Benetton, but then Williams became really good. And then he left Benetton and went to Honda when Honda weren't being very good and all of a sudden Renault were being very good. And I think that in some ways Nico is a bit like that, apart from the fact that the teams he's left haven't become World Championship winning cars all of a sudden. The fact that there's such a competitive field at the minute, the top guys are all very good and there's only really one of them that we're thinking, you know, isn't going to be around for too much longer, makes it very difficult for a young driver like Nico to build up in the series. It'll either take Mercedes to figure something amazing out, or it will take a seat opening up somewhere higher up for him to win races. And Rosberg's one of those drivers who you'd love to see win a race. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously all the history attached to him as well, with, you know, KK and everything. But... I mean, he's a very nice guy. I mean, he doesn't get involved in too many incidents. You don't see him moaning every 10 seconds to everyone. He's just one of those guys that puts his head down, races, does well, but unfortunately doesn't have the material to do better. But let's just say, for instance, that Rosberg was in a Red Bull uh, or a McLaren or a Ferrari. Could you actually see him winning some races? Yes. What team he'd go to would depend on how many he'd win. I don't think that he'd fit in one at Ferrari especially with Alonso there at the minute. But if you put him at one of the Red Bull, in one of the Red Bulls or one of the McLarens, then definitely there's a possibility of him winning races. Well, Sauber's Kamui Kobayashi finished in the points yet again as he finished ninth. And Lotus Reynolds' Vitaly Petrov picked up the final point as he came home in tenth. Uh, also well done to Daniel Ricciardo for finishing the race in what was only his second start in Formula 1. And also to Karun Chandak, who also managed to finish the race. The Indian driver replaced Jano Trulli uh, for the German Grand Prix weekend and will finish in the race was I suppose the best uh, Karun could have wished for well yeah there's been all the questions as to why he was in the car this weekend um, so as I'm concerned it's simple it's see how good he'll be coming Indian Grand Prix later this season and I think Trilly knew that in advance and he just wasn't letting on to it I think that the fact that he finished I mean yes he had the spin but the fact that he finished the race finished with all four wheels on the ground and didn't get into too much hassle would have been a good result for him. I think the 
issue is why Lotus are still switching between three drivers. Whether it's a money issue, if it's a money issue, then it's very disturbing because pretty much they'll never be able to make it up if they haven't got a constant stream of money coming in. And if it's otherwise, then they need to figure out who their two drivers are. Because as far as I'm concerned, you should only really change the driver if your driver's injured. Simple as that. Or ill, or something like that. But I think changing your drivers halfway for the season does nothing for your team morale, does nothing for your driver morale. And just quickly, coming back on to uh, Karun Chandok, uh, no doubt the Indian fans will be hoping uh, Chandok will be driving for Lotus at the inaugural Indian Grand Prix in October. Well, yeah. And to be honest, if he doesn't get a seat at Lotus, there's still a Virgin car and there's still a Hispania car he could probably jump into if he gets enough money. Um, especially the fact that being the Indian Grand Prix, he'll probably have some Indian sponsorship with him. So it would just be a case of, you know, does he get a seat or who does he get a seat with rather than will he get a seat? But it'd be nice to see him. I mean, it's always nice to have, you know, a home driver at your home Grand Prix. And I think that's what causes some issues with attendance at places like Turkey, because there's no Turkish driver there. Whereas you see, you know, Silverstone. I think Silverstone's had the least British drivers in the last few years, and they've had in a long, long time. But because of the quality of the British drivers, they sold out. They do their best attendances ever. And in Germany as well, you see all the seats are sold out. Everything's packed. Obviously, Italy's got, you know, you suppose see, so your Ferrari issues. But it, it surprised me why some tracks are so dull. And it's one of the reasons simply is because of the fact, you know, that there's no Formula 1 driver to cheer on. You've got no local guy. And uh, finally, uh, Timo Glock has signed a new contract extension at Marussia Virgin Racing. Good news all around for the team. It's good news for the team, yeah. Um, I think the fact that they've got an experienced driver for them for so long now will help them develop a car and it'll give them some form of stability because I think that's what the bottom teams have issues with at the minute is when they come to design a new car um, you see at the top of the field they design it either around one of the guys or it's got a kind of a balance between the two of the guys Uh, but if you're designing a car and you don't know who's driving it then you can't really design a car because the way Formula 1 is nowadays is you've got to develop a car to suit the drivers driving it. So the fact that you've got one, one driver now who they know is going to be in the car, they can always develop the car around him now. Timo Glock, he's been in Formula 1 a while. He's one of those drivers that is a good driver, could have got a couple of race wins, but was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I think that he'll only ever be remembered for not having enough grip in the last corner of the Brazilian Grand Prix 2008. Simple as that. <laughs> well, Will, thank you very much for coming in to review uh, the German Grand Prix. If you want to have your say on the German Grand Prix, then you can send a tweet at Formula One Fancast or at Baggies20. And to keep up to date with the latest Formula One news, visit www.formulaonefancast.com. From me and Will, cheerio. Bye.